please welcome to the stage Professor Karl-Heinz Mayer. So good morning, everybody. It's great to be here, and I appreciate you coming to the morning session. And uh, I decided that I would be a little bit entertaining because it's early in the morning and we all have to wake up. So this is about brain science in the information age, and I will, in the next 15 minutes, uh, do three experiments uh, with all of you, and we will see what we learn from those experiments and what we learn about brain science and information science. The first experiment is a very simple one. I will ask you to calculate 3,487 times 26,011. This is computation. This is what you call computing. And uh, obviously, if you do that, it will probably take you about 100 seconds or more. Uh, you can use some tools like a piece of paper and a pencil, but it will be about 100 seconds. So if you do the same on your cell phone, uh, you will get the result, which is 90,700,357. And uh, your cell phone is a computer which ca typically carries out 80 or 100 billion uh, computations per second, many of them in parallel. So every 10 to the minus 11 seconds, it produces a result of this quality. So what I conclude from that is that our brain is a lousy computer. So all these approaches to uh, copy computing that we do in the brain into synthetic systems seem to be pointless because uh, it's pretty hopeless to compete against your cell phone already. Uh, so is the brain really a computer that should be mimicked, that where we can maybe produce a new technology? Well, I have a second task for you, and that's the following. It will be much shorter. It only takes 200 milliseconds. And I would like to ask you to, to look at the screen uh, and, and, and see what you recognize on, on the next image. I will only show it for 200 milliseconds, so you all have to be very attentive. So that's the following. Okay, I hope it works. All right, did you see it? It was... It was a blue cat with white wings. And of course, you all know that there are no blue cats with white wings. Uh, there are no cats with wings at all. Uh, so you have never seen anything like that, but you were still able to recognize it. And you had some emotions, like you were surprised or upset or amused or whatever. All that happened in 200 milliseconds. So yesterday, we heard about time scales. And time scales are extremely important in the brain. And consequently, they are very important if you want to simulate or emulate parts of the brain. So this is the millisecond scale. On the millisecond scale, a lot of exciting things are going on in, on the brain. Uh, but there are other things. Uh, which you see on this image here, where you see the development on the brain of the brain over the first 20 years of our lifetime. What you see here is the fraction of gray matter in the brain, which decreases uh, from the age of 5 to the age of 20. So this is not aging, but it's the opposite. It's the formation of white matter, the formation of connections in your brain. That's the interaction with the environment, the developmental phase, where you see lots of cats and, and, and animals with wings and colors and things like that, and you build an internal model of our world. And it's that internal model which you use during those 200 milliseconds uh, to come to the conclusion that the picture I showed you of the blue cat with the white wings is a silly one, but you had an interpretation of it. And that already tells you everything about the challenge of brain simulation, of brain-like computing. You have to bridge these scales. You have to act on the millisecond level, or maybe even faster, if you want to apply this to uh, 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 analysis of, uh, of abstract data. But at the same time, you have to you have to cover things like, uh, like development, learning, and plasticity, which happens on a very, very different time scale. And that is a huge challenge for technology, which I would claim hasn't really, be, hasn't really been uh, solved. So bridging scales, I think, is the key challenge for brain computation. Bridging scales of time, temporal scales, which I just discussed, but of course also bridging spatial scales. If we use computers, state-of-the-art computers, to do brain simulations, this is what we can do today. This is a, 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 a computation that has been done by one of my colleagues, Marcus Diesmann, at the um, um, K lab, a Riken lab, the K computer in Japan. 
He has simulated 1 billion, 10 to the 9, very, very simple neurons on 65,000 microprocessors, which are assembled in this K computer. Uh, this is 1% of the brain size, where I put brain in quotation marks, of course, because the cells are extremely simple, and the architecture, the network architecture, is still very, very far from reality. So it's more a technological study and not a neuroscience study, but the technological study tells us that this machine uses 13 megawatts, which is power, by the way, not energy. Many people confuse these things. And uh, the simulation runs 1,500 times slower than biology. So as energy is power times time, and energy is what really counts, you can easily calculate that this simulation is 10 billion times less energy efficient than the brain. And you have to wait four years for a simulated day, for example, of learning and development. And that is a huge problem. And you see that although it may be very worthwhile to do cognitive computing, to recognize strange animals and strange events, uh, have predictions of the future, detect surprising events, this is a big challenge. On conventional computers, that will be extremely difficult. So one way to overcome this problem is to, be, to build more computers, to make them cheaper and, 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 uh, and uh, not so fast, but very densely packed. And this is the approach which we are doing in the, um, in the Human Brain Project. Uh, our colleagues from the Manchester group, uh, Steve Ferber's group, is building what's called the Spinnaker chip, uh, which is based on ARM cores. ARM are those microprocessors that you have in your cell phone, typically. And they make these printed circuit boards, which are a new kind of computer. They are that big and typically contain a thousand of those cores, of these processing cores. They run simulations in real time now. That means if you want to simulate a day, you have to wait for a day, which is already a big progress. Although, if you want to study developmental processes, that may still not be enough. The other approach is that you look to biology, you see that in cells, ions are being transported, there are conductances, there are capacitances, there are voltages, and these are physical quantities, physical quantities which you could implement directly by using batteries, resistors, and capacitors. And this is the second approach of computing, which we follow up in the Human Brain Project. This is our own group, where we build strange devices, like the one you see on this picture here, on this photo. Uh, this is a device featuring 200,000 neurons, 50 million synapses, and it's interesting because these are physical systems where you can tune the time constants. In contrast to normal computers, they are not driven by external clocks, but really by the physics of the devices, like in your own brain. And this system has been tuned to run 10,000 times faster than biology. So here, if you want to simulate the day of learning, development, and plasticity, you don't have to wait a day or four years, but 10 seconds. Of course, there is a price to pay. The models which we have at the moment, the neurobiological models, are relatively simple, but we are planning to improve that in the future. So looking to the uh, complete picture, this is the computing strategy, uh, which I find very exciting that we follow in, in HPP uh, in, in a special space. It's the metric of number of neurons so in a way, a measure of the size of the system and uh, the speed, the simulation speed with respect to real time. And I claim that the speed with respect to biological real time is a key parameter. I don't think that just putting connectomics results on a computer, switching on a computer will give you any interesting insights. You really have to go through the phase of learning and development in order to see how information is processed and stored in systems like that. So this is the, the strategy. You see many lines there. The blue lines are conventional computers, which reach out to a certain speed with respect to real time. The speed is given by sort of the quality of the processor. The computer scientists call this the strong scaling. And then you can increase the system without paying a price for simulation time if you just switch on more and more of those processors. Those are the blue vertical lines. This is what's called weak scaling. Okay? And at some point, you run out of processors. But then you can share processors. And you can do some kind of time sharing or multiplexing. And by that, still increase the uh, uh, the, the, the size of the system, but of course then, because you have to switch neurons back and forth between processors, the system becomes slower. 
And here you see exactly what we have seen on the K computer. If you go to slow down factors of a thousand or so, you can reach mouse brain, eventually human brain. The upper two blue lanes are the exa lines are the exascale computer that we are planning to construct in the human brain project. The two red lines are what I call the neuromorphic systems. That's the massively parallel system of Manchester, which is running at real time the left of the red lines which sort of coincides with the future computers, that, the conventional computers that we are going to build in, in HPP. So why would you build that kind of a system? Well, it's very compact, okay? It's a lot more compact, it's a lot more energy efficient, and you can use it, for example, for robotics. These are systems that you can put on, on physical robots and you can interact with the environment. And then out there, at 10 to the 4 to 1, an accelerated system that, as far as I can see, is the only way to access time scales from milliseconds to years. Uh, what can you do? Give me, let me just give you two examples of, of things that we plan to do and, uh, and uh, that are examples of how we can use those systems. There are two approaches. One is based on uh, reverse engineering of biological systems and the other one is based on theoretical approaches, on theory. This is an example, a very simple example, on a reverse engineered biological system. It's a B and you know bees and insects in general do many interesting things, like for example they have all an, an olfactory sense, they can distinguish different flowers, and they do that by having chemical receptors uh, which are then combined to, be, to come to a conclusion, an association with certain flower types like roses or tulips or whatever. So from the point of machine learning, this is what we call a multivariate data analysis. So, so you have inputs from many different sensors. They don't reflect the, the different flower types, but it's the combination which then comes to the conclusion that this is a rose or a tulip. And this kind of, of analysis is very, very useful, not only for the insects, but also for the way we do data analysis, big data analysis today. And yesterday, Henry already mentioned the interest of SAP in this kind of, uh, of, of approach, neuromorphic computing approach, and, and for example, building on the circuits that we reconstruct from insect brains. This is a very interesting application. Let me just give you one very concrete case, okay? This is a Swiss passport, which you see at the right upper corner of this slide. And if you, if you look to the right lower corner of the Swiss passport, you see this little symbol there, the circle in the middle of a white rectangle. You all have that on your passports. And, and this is your biometric data, okay? This is your biometric data that's stored on your passport. And the biometric data is reflected a little bit in this picture of this young lady there. You see points on the face and various distances between the eyes and the nose and the lips and the ears and, and, and all these kind of relations that characterize your face. And that's exactly a multivariate data analysis. So if you combine this data, you can come to a conclusion who this person really is. And this is a, a, a process that's being done everywhere. It's done on airports these days, but it's also done with many other abstract data. And, and it consumes a lot of computing power. And this is a potential short-term application of neuromorphic computing. We have done that already with the existing system, so it's, a, it's an experimental reality. It's not just speculation. And this particular chip, which I show you here just for illustration, it, it, it has already shown that these systems are actually a million times better in energy efficiency today, including all the overheads that you have from system engineering, and they run 10,000 times faster than biology. So there is a place for this special type of computing, in particular if it comes from pattern recognition. It comes to pattern recognition. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, this is a deterministic system. So if you want to repeat the experiment, you want that the same result appears every time. You don't want, if you put in your passport, that the result is stochastic, that sometimes you're recognized and sometimes you're not recognized. Now, that is actually not the case in the brain. The brain is a bit different, and I will do now a, a final experiment with you. So this is deterministic, sorry, I forgot this slide. Uh, if you repeat the experiment, it's like these two, these two dice here, uh, which you see are not real dice, they have uh, six, the face of six on all six sides, and the result is always the same. That this is not the case in biology. You see here, this is another animal which you can try to recognize. It's uh, a bit of a strange animal, it's either a duck or a rabbit, 
And uh, it's not so easy as in the case of the blue cat with the white wings. Uh, you switch between two solutions, and you never see the same solu the, the, both solutions at the same time. This is evidence, experimental evidence, that you get from your own brain, uh, that your brain is a stochastic device. And it has stored the information about ducks and rabbits, but at this moment it's not so sure whether it's a duck or a rabbit, and it switches between these two solutions. This is what we call stochastic computing, and I said there are two approaches to using these new kind of computers. One is reverse engineering of, of, of biological systems, and the other one is theory-based. And for the stochastic computing, there is a theory today which has been developed in previous projects and which can also be implemented on these neuromorphic computing systems. So in a way, we are now using real dice, and we have shown that in the brain, by the learning and developmental process, you store distributions of probability from which you take samples if you, if you come to conclusions. So this is all very exciting, and uh, just as an example here, this is an experiment we did with handwritten characters, where the system learned these characters without being informed that those are characters or numbers. It just de detected that those are interesting features, and then it, uh, by, by looking at these blue points, you see that the system stays in the location of the characters and very rarely is in between. It's like you switching between uh, the duck and the rabbit. Let me finally come to a more political aspect of, uh, of neuromorphic computing. I mean, with all the advantages, that is, the, the ability to learn, the energy efficiency, uh, the timing efficiency, also the robustness, which I didn't discuss here, it's not surprising that there is a growing number of projects in the U.S. and in the, uh, in the European Union. And uh, at the moment, there are five, I would call them, complementary approaches to neuromorphic computing. And I think this complementarity is really, really essential because at the moment, we don't really know how to do this. We are still pretty much in the dark, but it's very important that we try out things, that we don't wait until the brain has been understood. At some people, as some people actually suggest. I think that would be a bad idea. We have to learn how to build these systems and then in collaboration with neuroscience have to improve our knowledge and build better systems. So these are the five approaches which go from things that are still very, very close to conventional computing like the Spinnaker system in the UK down to very strange things like custom hybrid systems done by the company Qualcomm in the US where you combine conventional processing with uh, um, with neuromorphic cores. Is there anything in common? Well, uh, like the brain, they are all massively parallel, really massively parallel. They are always asynchronous in communication. There is no synchronicity, at least not imposed by an external clock. And because we know so little and we want to use these experimental as experimental devices, there is a very, very high deg degree of configurability. So you, as a user, are able to decide what you want to do with these systems. So this is a very encouraging program which is currently going on in the world. And uh, if I look to the agencies and the companies that support these, these are kind of the biggest players, I would claim, in neuromorphic computing. And on the left side, we have the U.S. groups, and on the right side, we have the European group. So uh, in the U.S., the funding agency is actually mostly DARPA. Companies involved are IBM and Qualcomm. In, the, in Europe, the funding agencies are the European Commission, and uh, the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And of course, the project is HPP. If you look at the, the names on the left side and the right side, there is a clear asymmetry, as you can see. Uh, the European side is, I would say, very academic. Okay? So there are the funding agencies, of course, but the Human Brain Project is primarily an academic project. It's about learning how the brain works, how it stores information, how we can use uh, modern computers to simulate it. On the left side are major, very, very major companies in computing, like <laughs> hardware companies like Qualcomm and IBM. And that is the thing which worries me a little bit. I mean, for two reasons. First of all, the companies on the left side clearly invest more into the field than the activities on the right side. And because this is about hardware development, real chip development, it's a matter of time until the people on the left side will really take over the field. I mean, at the moment, we are still doing pretty well, uh, uh, but, but we have to fight very hard to keep track. Uh, the other thing that worries me a little bit is that in Europe, at the moment, there is very, very little interest from the uh, industry side. 
there are very few companies that really like to look into the aspects of brain-inspired computing, and I think we have to change this. Uh, this is all I have to say, and I'm very open to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.